Aloha and welcome to Inside Hawaii Real Estate, a community real estate talk show dedicated to providing up-to-date information news to Hawaii home buyers, sellers, and investors. I'm Will Tanaka with my co-host, business partner, and wife, Leonie Lab, a realtor with over 20 years of experience in leadership roles in the Hawaii real estate industry. Thanks, Will. Will is a full-time realtor with a background as a lawyer. He's also a law school professor and the former head of a Hawaii title and escrow company. Together as full-time realtors, we work as a team to bring you the latest in Hawaii real estate. And we have a very special guest today with us. He's born and raised in Hilo, Hawaii. He graduated in political science from University of Hawaii, and he has dedicated most of his career to public service. In fact, right now he serves as the Director of Communications for Hawaii County, also known as the Big Island. And he works directly with Mayor Mitch Roth. Welcome, Cyrus Jonathan. Hey, hello, everybody. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, oh, so Aloha and welcome, Cyrus. You are the man. You're so passionate about community and government, public relations, and I think a lot of us in your circle of friends would call you the ultimate community advocate to address the disparities between, you know, the underserved populations, affordable housing, and speaking of affordable housing, I mean, that is the really hot topic these days. You, you know, I know you're in the midst of the legislative session. We really appreciate your time, you know, for being here. And you and Mayor Roth have been the biggest advocates for affordable housing, especially on the Big Island, where workers have to commute all the way from the east side, Hilo Town, all the way to the west side, like Waikoloa, Kailua Kona. And, you know, to kind of kick it off, what's going on with affordable housing? You know, I mean, just to give you the 30,000 foot elevation overview, right? When we came into office December 7, 2020, uh, there were 100 and, uh, 1,000 and 1,200 homes in our affordable housing pipeline, right? 1,200 homes. Uh, that Those were homes that weren't built yet, but were slated to be built, um, that there were entitlements for, so on and so forth. We were able to raise that up from 1,200 to 6,900 uh, in just three short years. Uh, not only have we raised it up um, considerably by working with you know our state partners, by working with developers, by working with others, um, who are committed to fighting housing for local people. Um, but we we're able to bring 300 to market in the first three years. This year alone, we'll be bringing an additional 500 homes to market. <clears throat> so essentially 800 of those, those 1200 homes that were, that were just thought or, you know, conceptions when we came into office are, have already either been built or being built as we speak. Uh, and those are homes that are going to be sold anywhere between 30% to 60% AMI. And for folks out there that don't know what that means, that's a family of four that makes $74,000 collective in a household can now afford a place to live and not only live to own. That is impressive. So 1200 to nearly 7,000 affordable housing units. I mean, how is that even possible? I mean, in the three years, how do, how do you make the impossible possible? I mean, you, get you know, I, I think one thing that we really had to do was we had to prove to people we could do it. And what we did, we focused on our building um, permitting system. You know, when we came in, I think if if you were to turn in a single family residential home permit, just one, um, even if it was, a, you know, a prefabricated home or one of those, um, you know, it, it was like a, a stock sort of uh, a layout or, or design, um, it would take anywhere between 200 to 250 days with no corrections, right? Essentially, that's just, I'm turning in a perfect application I would still have to wait 200, 200 plus days. You know what that does for developers? It, 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 um, it, it makes them weary because, you know, loans and, and, uh, and funding and financing, all of those types of things, uh, rely on time. And so the longer that it takes them to even get the permit in longer it takes them to build the home, uh, the less chance for them to keep some of that funding, uh, the less chance it is for them to complete the project on time and on, and on price point. Um, because of inflation, the rising cost of, um, of materials, you know, all of these things play, play a role. So we focused on the building permitting process. We said, we're going to get this right. Uh, and we did, you know, we were able to lower that from 200 to 250 days with no corrections to, you know, an average of like 34 to 42 days, um, on any given month. And I think when we were able to put that investment in, show them what we could do on our side, uh, they were more willing to show us what they could do on their side. And so. 
none of this, of course, would be possible without partnerships, right? And we have great partners in this state. We have folks that, you know, build affordable housing as, as a passion. I mean, they could make way more money doing high-end uh, projects, especially in Honolulu. Um, but no, they choose to build bigger scale, larger scale projects that are affordable to local people. And I just want to show, throw, you know, a shout out to folks like Stanford Carr, um, and others whose career have really, you know, even though they've uh, amassed a certain amount of wealth, um, you know, doing it, they've really focused on the local person because that's where they come from. You know, a lot of these guys are giving back in their own way and that's through development. Also, we have great state partners, um, you know, the governor has made housing a priority. Um, so big shout out to him, HHFTC, and a lot of these other organizations, Keith Cotto here on the Big Island, <clears throat> that all, um, you know, have have really dedicated their career and their service to focus on this issue. And and so when we double down on our side, um, they, they, they double down on their side. And that's how you see the proliferation of um, these units go from 1,200 to almost 7,000. You know, it's so positive to hear your perspective because you're a local boy, born and raised, and then you can share that perspective with us in addition to the role and the voice that you have in in local government. So it's just very refreshing to hear that and so positive. And I hear about the rising construction costs here on Oahu. Is it even worse on the Big Island or is it? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think our our, our guys, especially our local folks, Jason Fujimoto, HPM, Hulk, um, you know, they try to keep costs down as much as they can for our local families. Again, you know, this is a local local grown company. That's what uh, Big Island is built on. And, and you know, of course, we have bigger box chain stores, Lowe's, Home Depot, whatnot, um, hot store lumber. But, you know, the, the price is the price. And, and often it's supply and demand. Um, a lot of times it's shipping. Uh, the cost of fuel dictates a lot of times, you know, the, the market, uh, as well as a lot of other factors that... Um, make it iffy. And so, yeah, I would say the longer, particularly here, the longer that we make somebody wait, the more money they're going to pay guarantee, even if it's just a week, even if it's just a month, that week, that month, it adds up and can make add an extra 10,000 to $12,000 to a home. And that's not something that, that we want to do. Hey, you know, going back to what you said earlier about the permitting process, I mean, it's incredible to get it down to less than two months. And I, I did hear about a law that was passed that like any permit application has to be at least reviewed or approved, you know, within six months. So that is, um, that's a huge step forward for, for the big island. And, and I, I hope, you know, we could do the same for Oahu. Yeah. I know Mayor Blagiardi is working, working hard on it. I know they're looking at AI and other, uh, forms of software to really help with, uh, some of the issues. They're also looking at some pay raises over there on Oahu as well. And I think, you know, the, the reality is that, that government um, especially local government, our colonies, our cities, you know, it's a great job and you can do a lot of really good stuff for the community from these roles, uh, but they don't pay very well. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. We won't get into for this segment. Uh, but if we can figure out how to pay people more, they'll put more time, more effort into their work and more things will get done because they'll feel their value for the service that they provide. And so looking at it from that baseline frontline level, just from the intake process alone, um, showing that value to those folks is really important. And, and we here in Hawaii County, we, we do value them. Uh, and we try to give them all the all we can, because that's the, sometimes the hardest job. Uh, sitting at the top is very easy sometimes. Uh, but when you, when you're in the weeds and you're in the dirt every single day and your hands are getting dirty, um, you got to remind people that, that they matter. So, yeah. Yeah. I feel like you are one of those that, you know, rolls up your sleeves and just you're, you're with the people. And do you think, you know, in terms of um, our viewers and people who, I mean, maybe many of us have been to Big Island. Uh, I know Leone would love to retire in Hilo, you know, where, where you were born and raised. But can you paint like a big picture overview in terms of what people have to deal with in terms of the actual commute that, you know, they're facing and, um, you know, what they're looking at on building more on the west side? How yeah, you know, I think yeah. over the last, uh, you know, over the last probably 20, 30, maybe even plus years, what we've seen is, is a lot of the work's been on the West side, right? Development with the hotels, right? We've had, we started, I think, uh, Hilton was the first major resort out there in the Waikoloa coastline, uh, probably built back in the late eighties, early nineties. Um, 
And and now you see five, six, seven huge resorts. You know, I mean, even if you're talking about further up the coast, um, you know, Mauna Kea Beach Hotel, Hopkins Hotel, all of those provided a, a serious amount of jobs, right? Because it's not just the construction of those jobs, which a lot of people on our side of the island in Hilo do. They work construction, they're laborers, they're bricklayers, they're cement masons. Um, and so th those provided huge jobs for a, a sustained amount of time. But not only did they provide the jobs for the construction, they provided for you know the the groundskeepers, the the um, housekeepers, the front desk staff, the sales staff, and all of the support services. The chefs, a lot of them come from the east side, right? It's cheaper to live in Puna than it is to live in Waikoloa. It's cheaper to live in Hilo, or it was cheaper to live in Hilo, I should say, than it was to live in Kona. Um, <clears throat> and so you have all of these people who are ingrained in this in this service or in the service industry, hospitality industry, that have been and continue to commute every single day back and forth two hours one way two hours the other way that's four hours a day in a car if you're driving the speed limit right and that is time away from your family it's time away from other chores other responsibilities and and it's time away from doing things that that bring you joy nobody wants to sit in the car all day i mean i love audiobooks but i can only listen to so many before i want to see my wife my dog my kids right and those type of things we have to take into consideration when we look at where do we develop next? Where do we need to make affordable? And what does affordable mean for those people that we want to live there? Oh, my goodness. It's so, so in terms of the affordable projects that, you know, because you mentioned that there's like now 6,900 6, coming online. Tell us about some of the, the ones that are coming up soon, like Coloco Heights. Yeah, so Coloco Heights is a great project. It's right in the Irving for right in... Um, Kailua Kona, right above Costco, for those of you who are familiar with that area. 99 units for um, residential and then one live-in sort of caretaker, manage, property manager sort of uh, apartment. So essentially 100 homes, 30 to 60% uh, um, AMI. And and those, you know, those homes are to afford to to buy, but also you can rent in the in the short term, right? So you can either rent to own or you can you can own outright. And if you choose to just rent, you know, those are rents that, like I said earlier, for folks that are making like 74000 maybe 45000 per household, you know, those rents are like 500 to to 1000 bucks. And and for places like right in Kailua Kona with a view of the ocean and a vista and all that, you're not going to get that price. And so, like, that's what affordable housing is when it's government subsidized and government run. It's not that's necessarily the development was a government run, but government supported because you get these great gems in these great locations and you keep those price points at, at, at such a level where you know it's going to a local family. You know it's going to go to somebody who deserves it and needs it and wouldn't otherwise be able to afford it, that area. That, that is awesome. Yeah, because I think um, similar to here on Oahu and I obviously across the state, there's going to be buyback restrictions, share the appreciation so that they, you know, people who actually get in, they're, they're not trying to capitalize on, well, you know, appreciation, but, you know, the the intent is to get people to live in there, not just rent, but to afford um, homes and live there for the long term. So, yeah, you know, one of the things I talk about, and I'm sorry if I, if I cut you off, but one of the things I talk about a lot with people, especially my friends uh, and, and the mayor as well, is this idea and concept of generational housing, Right. When you give somebody a home, after that mortgage is paid off, you they they have the ability, so long as they can pay the property taxes to live there forever, that means their generation, their kids' generation, and, and so on and so forth. And you know, even if the home depreciates in value, even if the home um, you know, falls apart, they still have the land. And 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 to me, that's something that we really have to make sure that we look at because a lot of our local families, that's what happens, right? Maybe they go off, maybe they buy their own place, but a lot of times the inheritance of that land is is really how we continue to build wealth. We, we can take out HELOC loans on these properties. There's all these other opportunities that come when you talk about the equity, <clears throat> when you talk about what it, what it means to have this, this, um, this asset of value in your portfolio, right? Now, all of those things are really, really important. And once we can do that, we can create generational wealth. So generational homes create generational wealth. We break poverty um, and we create healthier, safer, and happier communities. It must feel good to be, you know, part of this and sort of instrumental and in being kind of out on the front lines, making sure that 
you know, these things are moving forward. And then also to be able to report that they are moving forward and everything. So it must feel really good. And I mean, when you're putting, if, as you know, legislation goes and all that, but for these affordable units, are there roadblocks? Are there, what are, what are the challenges that you folks or you've seen developers facing, or I don't know if you want to get into that. Yeah, why not? You know, I mean, everybody out there, if you're watching, I'm speaking solely for myself and not the county of Hawaii today. Um, but I, th I think one of the things we really have to talk about is a true uh, barrier to building houses, particularly on the west side, like I said, where most of the jobs um, are, uh, most of the inter industry is still being created, um, is water. And our, co our Commission on Water Resource Management hasn't given back uh, to hasn't hasn't given the rights to another water well in the Irving core of in of Kona for quite some time. Our hydrologists at the um, at the county and our Department of Water Supply have said that the multiple studies um, they stand by their work that we do have the amount of water necessary to drill another well and support thousands more homes on the Kona side in the aquifer at a sustainable yield. Uh, and for those of you who don't know what that means, basically it means that. The, the well will continue to refill itself beyond what we would take um, with with a great uh, barrier or a great cushion uh, between it. So we wouldn't even be running it nearly to half capacity um, with how, you know, if we were to build, drill that well. But for some reason, the state uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources, Commission of Water Resource Management um, hasn't allowed um, for decades now the, the approval to drill another well. And so without that water, we can't build houses because it doesn't rain enough out there. And so mm -hmm. we have people within developers with entitlements, we have folks with properties, we have huge development projects and parks and other uh, great resources that are ready to go shovel ready as a matter of fact, that need the water entitlements. And that's the biggest barrier we've been trying to work through with the state. Um, they have changed leadership recently. We're looking to work with that commission looking to talk about what might be feasible and reasonable to them, maybe even if it's half the, the water entitlements to these to these properties and to these projects, uh, we want to get it going. And if we do, it will immediately um, create at least 2,000 plus homes on the west side of Boy Island. Well, thanks for sharing that. And we'll look forward to movement there in that area. It sounds like there's potential progress. So I hope that things can clear up because that would, it sounds like it's just ready to, to happen. So <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, we're going to keep, we're going to keep pushing so long as we're here in office and even after we're going to make sure we can make that push and, uh, we'll get them to come around guaranteed. Mm -hmm. That's great. And, and then to kind of tie in with affordable housing, there's been hot topics, uh, all these various bills on short-term vacation rentals, ADUs, uh, to address this housing problem. So let's start with the uh, additional dwelling unit bills. Uh, I think that was passed last year. Uh, yeah, but yeah. It, so yeah, I know I told you folks that, that we passed it last year. We wrote it last year. Uh, it's gone through a phase of council. It's going to be coming in front of council one more time. Uh, I do believe it's going to pass. It was written in collaboration with the council chair and our planning director, as well as the mayor's office. We do believe it's going to pass. Uh, and that's essentially going to give, you know, all of our residents the opportunity uh, to build additional dwelling units on their properties. And what the hope is there is, but, but they have to be for either one long-term rental or two for family. Right. And so that gives, you know, in some cases that'll give, uh, kids the opportunity or young adults, the opportunities maybe to create their family and, and get a start at their parents' property, but still in their own space, right. Giving them the dignity of feeling like they're out on their own, that they're doing something on their own. Cause that's really important as well. When we talk about, um, you know, sustainability. And we talk about building an island where people can thrive. Thriving is about feeling like you're thriving. And <clears throat> for us, we, we want to make sure that that dignity is there. Another thing that, uh, that it'll do is hopefully create more units for, for, for the housing market, right. For the rental unit and for the rental market. Um, I think places like Oregon and other larger cities have done this. I believe Oahu has something like it. And so, uh, we are hoping that the more folk, the more that people build these units, the more these units are filled. Um, and then the more these units are filled, the less of a strain we have on the rental market. Yeah, that was the only way that I could afford to buy my house, my first house back in like the early 2000s, because 
with an additional unit that we could rent out, then we utilize that rent to help us pay the mortgage, right? Which is a super scary thing when you're in your younger years and, you know, and everything to get into buying a house. And so it really brought comfort to be able to have that additional income to supplement so that we could pay our own mortgage. Yep, absolutely. And then, you know, getting into the SCVR thing, um, I because I, I do want to answer that question. Uh, this morning, I asked my planning department for some numbers, right? And so I'm not going to get like into the nitty gritty, but right now we have about 4,000 uh, registered big uh, STBRs on the island. Granted, there could be more, there could be, you know, I don't know how many more. We're not going to get into that specific portion, but there are about 4,000 registered. Of those non registered, of those registered, about 900 or so um, are non conforming use, meaning that they got a special permit to operate. Um, so we are looking at the potential of phasing out the non-conforming use permitted STVRs if the market continues to be strained like it is. And that's a difficult decision because, you know, we could, you know, we could say that, oh, everybody outside um, has, you know, everybody who owns a rent vacation rental is not from here or they're making millions of dollars or whatever. And that's simply not the case. You know, some people, they fill their vacation rental, I don't know, 12, 15, 16 times a year, barely make ends meet, but it is a little bit of extra income for a local family who happens to own some extra property, right? Uh, that could be the difference between a Disneyland trip for the grandkids or or even a medical bill or something like that, right? And so uh, the STBR situation, it is sticky. It's something that, you know, it, it's hard to explain to somebody who's struggling and somebody who is benefiting from it, um, you know, the, the, those two polar opposite perspectives on what's actually happening is difficult to communicate across the board. But what I can say is that, you know, if we do phase them out and nothing changes, then we have a bigger problem than just STBRs. Yeah. And in terms of, is there a bill that's gonna that's trying to increase the short term uh, rental period from thirty to one hundred eighty days? Yeah, so we have an STVR bill that's going up in front of our council. Uh, it was drafted again, kind of between the council chair and the planning department. There, you know, there's elements from both sides in there, um, but there is some language in the current draft of the legislation that talks about um, a short term being anything less than one hundred and eighty days. Uh, right now, the current law is 30, and I think that's a little bit extreme, especially, like I said, we don't really know what kind of inventory we're going to free up. And I think if we were to just go out with that strict and that strong of language, um, it could throw things off for a lot of people. We don't, you know, the one thing I don't want to do, and again, speaking for myself and not for the mayor or anybody else, is rock the market too much. You know, everybody, you, you've heard the saying, you know, rock the boat, don't sink the ship. Um, and I think that the the ease the the easier we go into things the less abrasive we are the better we can study and understand the true results of our work versus going in too heavy handed um and 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 creating a new problem that we didn't foresee coming and so that's my reservation there but I would hope that uh, that'll get settled in council and I'm sure the mayor's office um will be submitting testimony on, on these uh, these bills. Yeah, that, that's a great perspective. On Oahu, um, you know, it's still 30 days. About a year and a half ago, our mayor uh, passed the bill to increase to 90 days. There was a preliminary injunction earlier this year. The federal court ruled that um, that the, it, it's still a valid 30 day. You know, it, it should still be a 30 day um, short term vacation period. Period. So on a while who as of now it's still thirty days, but you, you know we'll we'll see how it goes. The short term vacation mentors, and then there's a there's always a fine balance, and I, I really like how you kind of uh, balance that out. You know, f from a perspective standpoint, I'm sure some people don't like how I balance it out, but uh, that's my perspective and reasoning, which is why I say I'm not working for the colony today, just working for for the people. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I, I want to get into something you said earlier because you gave yeah. me this really nice introduction. Um, and you said, oh, you know, these friends and people will call them a, a community advocate or this and that. And, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, as much as that is, I, the, the way that I look at it in this community is I'm paying a debt, right? I'm paying a debt back to all of the folks that were able to raise me, the folks that were able to um, provide nourishment when I was malnourished. And those, you know, whether that be physically or actually metaphorically, a lot of times more metaphorically than physically, if you look at me. Um, but I think the bottom line is is simple, is that we all can take care of each other over here. Um, and I think raising the points of 
how our house, our extra houses, our extra properties can value and benefit our neighbors is a lot more important and more potent um, than legislation can be. Because when you explain to somebody here on Hawaii Island how they can care for the person next to them, whether they know them or not, they're going to do it more often than not. And we have to rely a lot more, I think, on the goodwill and good nature of people, especially here on Hawaii Island where Aloha is still strong. Um, because, you know, it may, it may seem naive to say, but, you know, we can legislate ourselves into more problems, but we can't aloha ourselves into more problems. And so that's kind of my message when it comes to STBRs, when it comes to the affordable housing market, when it comes to a lot of the stuff where we're trying to figure out ways to put handcuffs on people, they just want to hug. That's so awesome. And, you know, as we're coming to a close, what what is your vision for the Big Island? Uh, you know, I think, I think my vision for the big island is that it continues to hold this special and unique spirit, like I said, of compassion, of care, um, but where people find equity. And, you know, when I say that, I mean, when everybody get at least one small kind of equal chance, you know, I want, if I, if I was to leave office, if I was to leave this opportunity in public service and I walked around and I saw kids, uh, you know, in Kilka that, that are, you know, or, or in, or in Pahala or in, um, Kohala or somewhere out in Okala, and I tell them about, you know, and I give them a, a, an idea, a dream, a vision. I say, yeah, you know, you're going to be a doctor one day. And that kid looks at me and said, uncle, get chance. That I know that I did my part in public service mm -hmm. because if they give them get chance attitude, that means that we've shifted a barrier. We've broken through, um, a ceiling of broken through a wall and we we're going to create opportunities for these kids. And it's going to extend far beyond our lifetime and they'll solve the problems that we don't. Chicken skin. <laughs> that was deep. That was deep. You know, I, I'm so appreciative and uh, grateful for, uh, to Lailan Bento, our mutual good friend for introducing us and connecting us because you're so powerful in, in so many ways, not just, you know, about the real estate, affordable housing, but just your vision for your big island, you know, as a local boy, it's like, wow, just that last part was just hit me really hard. So thank you so much, Cyrus. You're so awesome. Thank you. Thanks, for being thanks. Thank you, Cyrus. I appreciate okay. you both very, very much. And I look forward to doing this again one day. Wonderful. Aloha. Aloha. Right, we'll stay funny. Take care. this show why don't you give us a like or subscribe to our channel thanks so much